So today we're going to look at nuclear energy, benefits and burdens. There are two types of nuclear reactions, fission and fusion. They are actually very, very different, but they both release energy. And we can take that energy and convert it into electrical energy, which makes our society go. So the first one we're going to look at is fission energy. Hank is going to briefly describe fission energy for us. Now, to dislodge one of those nucleons and unleash that energy, there are two general types of nuclear reactions, fission and fusion. Fission occurs when a large nucleus splits into two lighter ones. Fusion is the opposite, when two light nuclei join together to form a heavier one. In both cases, the products of the reaction are more stable than the starting materials, and this is, as always, what drives the reaction. Fusion is the type of reaction that we use more often because it's the one that we're better at initiating and controlling, at least so far. And whether it's used in power plants or bombs, the most common fuel for fission is uranium-235. There are several ways that it can react, but the reaction is almost always triggered by hitting uranium with neutrons from another source. When that happens, the uranium splits into smaller atoms. One such reaction produces Krypton-92. Yes, Krypton is a real thing, along with Barium-141. Three free neutrons and lots of energy. This energy is released mainly as the kinetic energy of the escaping particles, which is immediately transferred to the surroundings as heat. Some energy is also released in the form of electromagnetic radiation, such as visible light, x-rays, and gamma radiation. Nuclear power plants use the energy released by these reactions to convert water to the steam which then is passed through turbines, spinning a generator, powering cities and stuff. Because of the enormous amounts of energy these reactions can release, nuclear power plants can potentially produce lots of electricity. But there's also, I think you may have heard, some serious drawbacks. For one thing, as you know, atoms rarely exist in isolation. We write the equation of a fission reaction as if it's just one atom, but in reality, that one atom is surrounded by many, many more. And if one little neutron can trigger the reaction and that reaction liberates three more neutrons, well, I think you can see where this is going. If the reaction isn't controlled, each reaction triggers three more and every reaction releases the same amount of energy, which adds up fast. This is pretty much the definition of a chain reaction, and it is the basis of the remarkable power of a nuclear weapon. The All right, so he pretty much summarized everything that I'm going to teach to you today in about three minutes. So let's slow down and take it step by step. What you're going to need for the EOC is to know the difference between fission and fusion and to be able to distinguish fission and fusion reactions. So, today let's focus on fission. The same type of reaction occurs in nuclear power plants, but those reactions are controlled in several ways to keep them from getting out of hand. The fact is, these chain reactions have the potential to produce far more heat than the plant can use, so much more that the temperature can easily rise to dangerous levels enough to melt the uranium. This is the meltdown that you hear about, and most reactor cores are immersed in water to disperse the heat and prevent this from happening. But that that's not enough on its own to control this thing. If the chain reaction is allowed to run freely, no amount of water can remove the heat fast enough to prevent a meltdown. The real way we control nuclear reactions is with control rods. They're made of materials that readily absorb neutrons and they're inserted between the fuel rods of uranium to slow the neutrons down and therefore slow down the reaction. They can be put in more to slow the reaction more and lift it out more if you need more heat. Now the other sticky wicket of fission reactions is the stuff that's left behind. These reactions not only produce products that are still radioactive, they produce tons of them. Lots of different troublesome kinds. Like we saw last week, uranium undergoes many different types of nuclear decay. So not only does each uranium atom produce isotopes of krypton and bromine, but that process also produces many other isotopes of other elements. And as these various nuclei break down, they release more neutrons and more unstable products, and the process continues for a long time. All of these reactions eventually yield stable products, but they have half-lives ranging from a few years to tens of millions of years. The products with shorter half-lives stabilize pretty quickly, but they release particles and energy like crazy during that time, so they're extra dangerous. The ones with longer half-lives decay more slowly, release less energy, but that means it takes a very, very long time for them to stabilize. So long, in fact, that for human purposes it may as well be forever. That means they'll always be an issue in our environment, which is why we're always looking for ways to store them and keep them out of our way. All right, so here we go, step by step. What are fission reactions? Splitting a large nuclei using neutrons into smaller nuclei. Splitting a large nuclei into 
smaller nuclei using neutrons. Here's the deal. Uranium comes in two major isotopes. Uranium-238 and Uranium-235. I'm going to simplify this a little bit, so I'm going to exaggerate a little bit, but you'll get the idea better. 98% of all the uranium is 238. 2% of all uranium is 235. So what? So what is the fact that 238 cannot be split by us? 238 is absolutely useless to us. Worthless. Yes, 98% of all of the uranium in the world is absolutely useless. It is radioactive, but it will only split and explode when it feels like doing it, which is, makes it completely useless to us. 235, on the other hand, if you hit it with a neutron, it will split into two smaller pieces, not equal, roughly equal, and three neutrons. So uranium-235 is the key to fission. To my understanding, though I may be wrong, there's only two major types of radioisotopes that we can fizz, we can split with a neutron, and that is Pu, plutonium, and, uroni and uranium-235. Okay? So that's what makes them so valuable to us. We exist here in Oak Ridge because the task of Manhattan Project was to take this percentage and lower it down to 85% by removing some of the uranium-238 from the sample and raise this up to about 15%. At that point, you have enough uranium-235 so that when it produces three little neutrons, it has access to enough uranium-235 to split more 235, and they can split more 235, and they can split two more 235, and split more and more and more and more and more and more. That is called a chain reaction. Left to itself, the energy will continue to build, 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 build until it is enough to destroy a city. Okay? So, that is why we call our credit union here Enrichment Credit Union. The process of taking that 98% and lowering it down to 85% and taking that 2% and raising it up to 15%, that's called enriching the, the uranium. Okay? And what we, if you've ever seen or heard of K25 and Y12 and X10, these were the different ways in which we were enriching uranium. Actually, to tell you the truth, these guys were enriching uranium. These guys were making plutonium. And X10 was only a test site. Once it was working, they created a much larger reactor in this place called Hanford, Washington, and they produced the plutonium that was used in one of the three bombs. There were three bombs. One was test detonated, and the other two were uranium enriched bombs, and uh, I don't know which one was which. Okay, but there were three bombs that were produced. Yeah, the really sad thing is that uh, we were all big and bad with Japan going, yeah, well, you know, we got two of your cities, and we can do more. Actually, it would have taken several months for us. That was a little bit of a bluff. 
it would have taken us several months, maybe closer to a year, to have enough fuel for another bomb. But, thankfully it worked, the war ended, and millions and millions and millions of people were saved. Describe the discovery of the first nuclear reaction. Two German scientists bombarded uranium with neutrons. They found that one of the products was barium. The Austrian physicist Lies Meitner was the first to explain what had happened. Uranium had split into two nearly equal parts. The world had seen its first nuclear fission reaction. Of course, the Germans were going, hmm, since we're a time to take over the world, it would be interesting to find a way of harnessing this process and making it into a bomb to kill the British. At the time, no, no, I mean, they were systematically killing the Jews by themselves. Uh, it was, they were, they had... No, actually, in 1938, it was just at the very beginning of the war, right? And so uh, they knew that it was going to take some time. They were hoping that the war would last long enough for them to have the bomb. Of course, it never happened. They, the war did not last long enough for them to be able to make the bomb. Over here, we started hearing, we started reading and understanding what Lise Meitner was talking about, and some scientists started trying to get across to the government, hey, we need to do this or else they will have an advantage that we don't. So Albert Einstein wrote a letter to Roosevelt saying, hey, uh, this is bad. We better get on top of it or else we're done for. And Roosevelt then gave the order to use this reaction to create a bomb that could allow us to defend ourselves. And thus, the Manhattan Project was born. But you'll learn all about that when we watch The Secret City. Here's an equation to this reaction. 235, 92, plus 10 neutron will form barium-140-56, krypton-93-36, and this is the key, three neutrons. Three neutrons. Will it always form barium and krypton. No. That's just this particular reaction. It could form any number of 20 different combinations. 20 different combination of isotopes. And therein is one of the biggest problems. If it always produced krypton and barium, all we would have to do is separate these two guys and store them in different places because they each have their own half-life and everything would be hunky and dory. It's not that easy. When you take apart a nuclear reactor, in order to deal with this used up waste products here, uh, you have to account for about 20 different isotopes. And it's virtually impossible to separate them all. Though they keep working on it. At RNL, they keep trying to find different ways to separate this waste into its individual components. I actually spent a summer trying to come up with one of those ways. I didn't. I was just the grunt. I was just doing the work. And the scientist that I was working for was trying to come up with a way of being able to separate these different isotopes. What is so special about uranium-235? It is the only naturally occurring isotope that can undergo fission. In other words, it's the only one that we can split. I already told you which artificial isotope can be split as well. What is that? Plutonium. Plutonium. P-U. Plutonium. I don't know. Whoever discovered it was a big fan of Pluto. nine planets or a big fan of Mickey Mouse's dog. Mm -hmm. How do you compare the energy given off by fission with the energy given off by chemical reactions? Oh, about a million times more. And that is what makes it so attractive. Where does this energy come from? Well, think about it. You have a nucleus. And the nucleus has neutrons and protons. And neutrons don't really care about anything else, but protons are very positive and don't like to be with other protons. 
And yet, the nucleus is somehow this teeny tiny little speck full of protons and neutrons. So something must be holding the protons together because they don't want to be held together. What's preventing the protons from just splitting up, divorcing from the nucleus, and go careening off in various different directions? Well, it's called the strong force. We know they don't. So there must be something very strong holding them together. So they came up with a very creative word, phrase of strong force. Actually, some scientists call it gluons. They think that it's not a force, that it's actually a particle that glues the protons together. It's called gluons. Strong force or gluons. Either way. If you have two smaller nuclei, you don't need as much strong force. You don't need as much gluon. So what they think is going on is that when an atom is split, the leftover gluons are given off as some form of energy. Sometimes you can think of it as gamma, heat energy, x-rays maybe even visible light. We know that it does glow when it's being stored underwater. So, the extra stuff that is no longer needed because we have two smaller nuclei is given off. That is the energy that we are trying to harness in a nuclear reactor. That is also the energy that will wipe out a city. How is strong force related to the energy released in nuclear reactions? The force not needed anymore once the atom has split into smaller parts is given off as energy. The two most important laws in chemistry is the law of conservation of energy and the law of conservation of matter taken independently Folks, nuclear chemistry completely wipes them, wipes them out. They don't, they don't function anymore. Because in nuclear chemistry, we do see matter being destroyed. And we do see energy being converted into matter. Weird, weird stuff. So what they've done is they've taken the two laws, which at one point used to be thought of as being independent of each other, and now they have been combined. So, nuclear chemistry uses the law of conservation of matter and energy. It used to be the law of conservation of matter and the law of conservation of energy, and now it's one and the same. An equation that has allowed us to be able to understand how matter can be called can be converted to energy and energy can be converted into matter is e equals mc squared if you watch science fiction then you have seen this um, equation being in use think about it in star trek they take randy and they convert him into energy then they beam Randy at the speed of light to a different location. And at that location, it is he is converted back into matter. We say that he has been transported. He has been beamed down to the planet. Wouldn't it be so cool if we had that technology? Because on the weekends, you could go to the local transporter station, and they can transport you to Tahiti while you're in the middle of winter you can spend the weekend in Tahiti and then you can go back be converted back into energy transmit it through satellites back down to Oak Ridge reconstituted into matter and hopefully all your parts are put in the right place and there you are you're back in Oak Ridge that would be so cool I think Stargate they they do the same thing when you go through that the, the gate, right? Yeah. So you, you're converted into energy. You're transmitted through wormholes to other parts of the universe. And then the other gate will make you come back into matter. 
So e equals mc squared has been very important to science fiction. So what is an unique result of fission? Or when you split an atom, what you used to split the atom can split other atoms. It's produced and it can split other atoms. The two smaller atoms that are produced are called daughter nuclei. Daughter nuclei. But the key thing is what you use to split the first atom is produced and those can split other atoms. So what is a chain reaction? If we hit Randy and Randy splits up into two smaller people and gives off neutrons, Randy's neutrons could hit Jackson, Emmy, and Riker and split them and they produce neutrons. Jackson's neutron goes over there and hits Ben and Casey and Jeff, splitting them up. And Casey's neutrons hit... That's Kelsey, not Casey. Kelsey, sorry, Kelsey. And Kelsey's neutron hits Grace and Devin, splitting them up. And then pretty soon, everyone's been split up. Devon. Sorry. I'm old. I get my names mixed up. The neutrons are released, which then spit, split more atoms, making the reaction continue off by itself. Critical mass is when you have enough stuff to let it go off by itself. You see, when we hit Randy, Randy may split up and it's, his neutrons are so tiny that it could very well just go off and never actually hit anybody. You gotta have enough Randys going off so that a um, lot of Na Randys are giving off enough neutrons for it to go off by itself. Until then, you have to be keep you have to keep supplying the neutrons. When it's ready to go off by itself, then you have a chain reaction. Okay, so here's Randy being split. Randy goes and becomes two smaller, what we call daughter nuclei, and here are three neutrons which can be used to split other atoms. Critical mass is when you have enough fissionable material present to allow a chain reaction. The radioactive Boy Scout never had enough fissionable material. He couldn't go critical. He had enough to make some plutonium, and some terrorists would be very interested in that. That's what scares me. If a 15-year-old boy could make a breeder reactor, what could people... They should scare you. It's called a dirty bomb. I mean, when you have stuff like... Uh, enough plutonium together you can make a small explosion but a small explosion could take out a lot of people in the middle of the city what two countries during world during world war ii realized the potential for weapons out of this concept and oh no the russians stole it from us germany okay here's a series of videos that will help you understand a little bit better in this video, we're going to talk about nuclear fission. <laughs> Unstable radioactive nuclei, which occur naturally, sometimes emit strong radiation, especially in isotopes of uranium like uranium-238 or uranium-235. 
The disintegration converts the uranium isotope into stable lead and in the process emits energy in the range of one to five mega electron volts. That's one to five million electron volts and even higher amounts of energy can be released by breaking unstable nuclei into even more parts. In 1939, a German scientist named Otto Hahn discovered that breaking up the nucleus of uranium-235 into two parts emits 200 million times the energy of the neutron which triggered it. He, along with his two colleagues, Lisa Meitner and Fritz Strassmann, found that when the nucleus of uranium-235 is bombarded with neutrons, it will absorb one of the neutrons. This results in an unstable compound nucleus, and the nucleus breaks into two equal parts. This process is referred to as nuclear fission. So, a process in which heavy nuclei are bombarded with neutrons and split into two equal masses, releasing enormous amounts of energy, is called nuclear fission. In the process, uranium-235 initially absorbs a slow-moving neutron, thus forming a highly unstable compound nucleus, uranium-236. This is what triggers the nuclear reaction. During the process of fission, uranium-236 splits into two product nuclei, which are barium-141 and krypton-92. You should notice that a barium atom has 56 protons and a krypton atom has 36 protons, which add up to the uranium atom's 92 protons. The unstable uranium-236 nucleus also releases three neutrons in the process. This happens because barium-141 has 141 neutrons and krypton-92 has 92 neutrons, adding up to a total of 233 neutrons. To balance the equation, uranium-236 must emit three more neutrons. The chemical equation of the nuclear fission reaction taking place can be represented by this equation. So as you can see from the equation, one neutron combines with uranium-235, forming an unstable compound nucleus, uranium-236. This unstable nucleus splits into two stable nuclei barium-141 and krypton-92. In addition to these two nuclei, three neutrons are also emitted, as well as a high amount of energy denoted in the equation by Q. Since uranium-236 emits three neutrons in the reaction, these neutrons can be absorbed by other uranium-235 nuclei, resulting in a chain reaction. This leads to exponentially high amounts of energy being released by a single reaction. Okay, so the question so, is, the how do we harness that energy? First of all, if you want to make a nuclear weapon, you don't want to harness it, you want to just contain it long enough to you know, blow somebody up, and thankfully, we've never had the opportunity or we've never had the reason to use a nuclear weapon ever again, right? Because you know we're the only ones who have used it. And you, know, you can debate back and forth, but the fact is that However many people, thousands of people that died in Hiroshima and Nagasaki would have paled by comparison to the number of Americans and Japanese that would have died if we had to have invaded Japan. As it was, more people died in, while we were carpet bombing. That's where you just go through and strafe a certain place, just, just pummel it with, with uh, bombs. We were carpet bombing um, Tokyo. So more people died, and you know, that's not brought up often, but more people died while we were carpet bombing uh, Tokyo than died in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You know, terrible, terrible situation that happened, and we can mourn about it, uh, about the loss of lives, but the fact is it ended the most bloody, bloodiest war in human history. So, Let's not worry about nuclear weapons. How about how can we harness this power? First nuclear reactor was built. What was it used for? Energy? No. It was built about five miles down as the crow flies in what we call X-10. We had the first nuclear reactor. It was built in order to make plutonium. It was a breeder reactor. It was made to its whole purpose was to make plutonium. It was a small one, and it really wasn't going to 
produce enough plutonium. So in Washington, in Hanford, Washington, that's where they made a much larger version of X-10 in order to produce the plutonium they needed for one of the bombs. What is the percentage of nuclear plants in the U.S. that strictly produce just, just, an, just electricity and are not part of our defense? About 80%. Some are breeder reactors, and we do make plutonium. That's why they shut down K-25, because they didn't need it anymore, because our nuclear reactors were making it. That's also why we won't allow the Iranians, or we don't want to allow the Iranians to have their nuclear reactor, because they'll look at us and say, oh, no, we're not interested in making a bomb. We're just concerned about global warming. And we know that nuclear reactors produce very little to none global warming gases so for the sake of the world we would like to make a, we would like to have a nuclear reactor so we can have cheap energy and not hurt the the atmosphere with harmful pollution send them windmills <laughs> send them windmills yeah okay so to the most americans that sounds oh that's so wonderful. They're concerned about global warming. Let them have a nuclear reactor. But people that have had my class now know if they have a nuclear reactor, they have a nuclear weapon. And these are the same people that time and time again have stated that they would like to destroy Israel. So, as of 1984, how much of our, our total energy needs does nuclear chemistry supply? Only about 20%. Maybe it's creeped up a little bit more, but nuclear chemistry has had a lot of bad press since 1984. Chernobyl and Fukushima, and people want us to shut them down and not build new ones. How do most electrical power plants produce electricity? Easy. You burn gas, or you burn coal, or you burn oil, produce a lot of heat, that heat is used to convert water into steam, and then the steam turns these big, giant flywheels. Did you ever play with pinwheels or flywheels when you were a kid? Oof. Okay, so you turn the fins on this flywheel, and that creates electricity. I'll show you how that works. A nuclear reactor works the same way. Nuclear power plants are thermal power stations which generate electrical energy from heat. They consist of numerous buildings and facilities, the most important of which are as follows. The turbine building houses several turbines as well as the generator necessary for electrical power generation. The containment building where the nuclear reactor is housed is made of meter-thick reinforced concrete. Inside this building, nuclear reactions take place where water is heated up. The cooling tower, which can be as tall as 200 meters, is where hot water is cooled. In order to easily understand the underlying principles, the following is a description of the most important components of a nuclear power plant that uses a pressurized water reactor, PWR. In the reactor pressure vessel, the nuclear reaction and the associated release of thermal energy takes place. In a pressurized water reactor, as in this case, the reactor pressure vessel stands about 12 meters tall. The walls are about 25 centimeters thick. Inside is where the fuel assemblies can be found. In pressurized water reactors... Okay, I think I can do a better job of narrating it. Okay, so these are called fuel rods, and they're going to contain... Isaac, pass that around. They're going to contain these tiny little, I don't know, they look like little pieces of chalk. And inside you have a little bit of uranium, enriched uranium, about 8%. Now, what was the magic number for a nuclear reactor? 15%. This will be about 8%. So can a nuclear reactor explode like a nuclear explosion? No. No. It... it the uranium is not enriched enough. Okay, so you're going to have a little bit of fuel in these tiny little rods that you see there. 
Okay, so these are called control rods, and they're made up of a material that can absorb neutrons. So when they insert those control rods into where the fuel rods are, they'll suck up the neutrons and pretty much shut down the whole reaction. Lift them up, and the neutrons can run around and do their thing. Here comes some pressurized water. This is water that will not boil at 100 degrees. It'll boil much higher than that. So this is basically a pressurizer. And this water is going to go into these vessels. The whole point is for the water to cool down the fuel rods. If you don't, those fuel rods will melt. And that's when we have a meltdown. So these fuel rods are producing an enormous amount of energy as the atoms are split. Here is what we call a heat exchanger. This water that's under a lot of pressure is going to go up these copper tubes. Notice, by the way, this water will inevitably pick up some radioactive particles. So this water is contaminated. This water is dangerous. But the water stays in these copper tubes and then come back. What happens here is that these copper tubes inside this chamber back here is immersed in water. That water is not under pressure. So that water can boil and does. Okay? So these things get red hot and will boil the water. The water, the boiled water, then goes up this tube right here and goes into another chamber. So this water is clean. It does not have any radioactive substances. Okay, so watch. The water boils becomes steam and heads out out of the pipe. Of course, this is cooling down the water that's in the, the copper pipes here. Pipe. Okay, here's your flywheel. As the steam goes through, it turns the flywheel and the flywheel is connected to this tube right here and it's called an electromagnet. It's a big giant magnet. Here are huge copper wires. I'm sorry, this turns this flywheel. Here are the big giant loops of copper wire as a electromagnet, maybe you played around with this when you were in middle school, as an electromagnet spins in copper wire, what does it produce? Electricity. So the steam turns the turbine, the turbine turns the electromagnet, the electromagnet in conjunction with this big giant and we're talking about two stories tall spool of copper wire create the electricity now you got to cool down this water to the turbine building it's steam the it steam needs to be turned back into liquid high pressure turbine and then is typically fed to two low pressure turbines all of the turbines are connected by a spinning shaft to the electrical generator which in turn produces AC electricity from the shaft's rotational energy. The steam is converted again into liquid form in a condenser and then returned back to the steam generator. The water needed for this often comes from an adjacent river or is cooled in a cooling tower. The water circulation and that's what the cooling are tower always is. kept set. Okay, so this water, this steam comes in here, turns the turbine, then the steam comes back, is condensed using water from the cooling tower. I'm sorry, the water comes from the lake or river. So this water is cooled down, it's sent up here where it runs through these teeny tiny little cubby holes and as it comes in, it just begins to cool down. Air, this is lifted up off the ground it's on stilts my friends you've seen how big these things are it's on stilts and it's designed in this design to draw 
air up and over. So as the air moves in and through, it cools down the water, allowing it to be put back into the, into the lake so, so it's cool enough not to harm any fish or animal life. All right, so the only water that is dangerous to us is this one right here. And it stays in this loop. Apart from one another, water in the primary circulation system never leaves the containment building. It this stays water here. This is radioactive, since it has been in direct contact with the fuel rods. Water in the secondary. This is the water that cools down that water and gets turned into steam. And is not radioactive. The cooling circulation. And then the final water is the water, water that comes from the lake. To condense the steam and it's in used. The to condense the steam back into water. Any questions? So here's another movie on nuclear reactor. Nuclear reactor. In this video, we're going to learn about the nuclear reactor. Nuclear reactors are the modern day devices extensively used for power generation as the traditional fossil fuels like coal are at the breach of extinction. A nuclear reactor is the source of intense heat which is in turn used for generation of power in nuclear power stations. Its mechanism is similar to that of a furnace in a steam generation. The steam is used to drive the turbines of the electric generator system. A nuclear reactor consists of three crucial components, fuel elements, moderator, and control rods. Fuel elements come usually in the shape of thin rods of about one centimeter in diameter and contain fissionable nuclei like uranium-235 or uranium-238. These rods vary in number according to the size of the reactor. In large power reactors, thousands of fuel elements are placed close to each other. This region where these fuel elements are placed is called the reactor core. These fuel elements are normally immersed in water, which acts as a moderator. The objective of a moderator is to slow down the energy neutrons in the nuclear reactor, which are produced during the nuclear fission process by the fuel elements. Thermal neutrons, which are the neutrons with energy of about 0.04 electron volts, are capable of producing fission reactions with uranium-235. During the fission reaction process, New neutrons are given out, which have energies of about 1 MeV. This is 1 mega electron volt. These neutrons typically escape from participating in another fission process, as they are accompanied by enormous energy release. In fact, the probability of these neutrons produce another fission reaction is 500 times less than that compared to a thermal neutron. This is where a moderator is extremely useful. Moderators have the capability to slow down, or in other words, moderate, the speeds of these high-energy neutrons so that they can in turn be used for a chain reaction to trigger multiple fission reactions of other uranium-235 nuclei. Commonly, ordinary or heavy water is used as a moderator in nuclear reactors because of the deuterons present in them which are capable of slowing down the neutron speed. Water molecules in the moderator are useful in slowing down the high-energy neutrons, which leaves the fuel element after nuclear fission. These high-energy neutrons collide with water molecules, thereby losing out on some energy with every collision and therefore slowing down substantially. A new fission reaction can now be triggered using this slow neutron by striking it with the fuel element. The third and most prominent part of a nuclear reactor are the control rods. In order to get a steady output of energy from the nuclear reactor, every single fission reaction should trigger another fission reaction and ensure the availability of spare neutrons released to trigger the chain reaction. By controlling the number of spare neutrons available at any given time, the rate of nuclear fission chain reactions can be controlled. This control on the fission reaction can be maintained using control rods. The main function of the control rods is to absorb any excess or spare neutron in the moderator in order to prevent any further fission reactions. Usually, such control rods are made of boron or cadmium. 
To increase the rate of fission reactions, these rods can be removed from the moderator. A steady output of energy can be maintained by inserting or removing the control rods in the nuclear reactor. Now that we know the components of a nuclear reactor, let's understand the working of a nuclear reactor. It's usually enclosed in a shield made of thick concrete walls. It consists of a reactor core, pump, and heat exchanger. The reactor core and pump are placed in contact with the water, which is usually the heat exchanger in these reactors. Due to the enormous amount of heat released during the fusion reaction, the surrounding water gets heated up and changes to steam, which is in turn used to turn the turbines. So huge heat energy gets converted into electrical energy. Water is continuously flown in and out of the nuclear reactor using the pump. So a nuclear reactor successfully generates nuclear energy from fission reactions. All right, hopefully you got that. So, how do nuclear power plants differ from coal-fired plants? Well, you need a ton of coal, oil, or gas to heat up the water. The key thing is the water must be heated so it can become steam, so it can turn the big giant flywheel that creates electricity. Okay? It really doesn't matter how you heat it. If you are a coal fire plant, you burn coal. If you're gas, you burn gas. If you oil, are oil, you burn oil. If you're a nuclear reactor, then you use nuclear fission. Really doesn't matter. The difference is tons of coal versus a large suitcase per year. Tons of coal per day versus suitcase per year. The nuclear fuel is in the little pellets that I showed you, little black pellets, and inside there's some uranium dioxide. There might be 10 million of those things in the energy rods or the fuel rods. They contain about two third. They contain mostly 238, with about 3% 235. What's the significance of it only being 3%? No nuclear explosion. Bad stuff can happen, and has, but no nuclear explosion, no. Control rods are made of a boron and cadmium. What is their job? What got him started? Who remembers? I just told you this. They talked about this in the uh, video. What gets uranium-235 started? Getting hit by a neutron okay you got hit by a neutron and then he gives off neutrons that's what we call a chain reaction what do the control rods do they absorb the neutrons you insert them in they absorb the neutrons it stops the chain reaction that's their job to stop the chain reaction by absorbing the neutrons no neutrons no fission Here's some control rods being inserted into a reactor. How is the reactor cooled? Water is kept under great pressure so it doesn't boil at 100. It'll boil at much higher degrees. Okay? There are also moderators. We'll talk about the moderators here in a second. Uh, concrete walls that are 6 to 12 feet thick. Wow. Steel walls, which are three feet th 2 feet thick. So, three feet thick. What else happens, helps to slow down the high-speed neutrons? They're called moderators. It's, it's heavy water. What is heavy water? <laughs> Hydrogen normally is one proton. That's it. Just a proton and electron. Okay, so that's the normal symbol. Deuterium has a proton and a neutron, which is odd. That's radioactive hydrogen, and it's slightly heavier, and it does a fairly good job of also absorbing the neutrons, as the movie explained. Three ways in which the energy it can be generated. Cheap and dangerous is the way the Soviet Union used to do it. I'll show you that. A little bit better, and the best is what the way we do it. Okay, the Soviet Union. Here is 
water being pumped in absorbs the heat from the reaction gets turned into steam that steam is used to turn the big giant flywheel which creates the electricity the big giant flywheel is going to take a lot of the energy away so it'll begin to condense and finally water from a lake or river is pumped in it comes in contact with these pipes that have the cool water in it and that will allow the steam to condense and it's pumped back in with Chernobyl one of these pumps failed stopped working they had backups due to human error the backups weren't put in when you stop pumping cool water into here the water that's here will continue to turn into steam if it continues to turn into steam and the steam escapes and allows the the fuel rods to no longer be immersed in water then the fuel rods will get super hot will begin to crack and release radioactive particles now you've got particles in this water and this is what happened in Chernobyl okay the particles in the water and then of course the steam is building up building up it's not able to cool down there, there were ruptures in the reaction vessel steam started coming out part of this material is uh, has uh, zinc in it the zinc reacted with the oxygen in the air to produce hydrogen gas hydrogen gas is used in space shuttle fuel plus oxygen gas makes water and a great big boom this sucker exploded they found fragments of the roof several miles away now you have escaping steam and smoke coming out with enormous amounts of radioactive particles the men who worked here knew that there was a town a few miles away and that all the people in the town were going to get enormous amount of, of radioactive materials raining down on them so they started a bucket brigade with water and with sand and with cement trying to stop this fire this whole thing melted down to the ground and the whole building began to catch on fire those men knew as they were building that bucket brigade and dumping sand and concrete in there they knew they were going to die and they all most of them died but their their hope was they needed to get that fire down to stop the spread of the radioactive smoke that was coming out as it is they gave the people enough time to evacuate so they did get exposure some exposure to radiation not as not enough to kill them they it did give them enough time to evacuate and now chernobyl the town chernobyl is a, a ghost town very few people live there it's contaminated terrible terrible and that's because the russians did this quick and dirty thing this water here is always if it's in contact with the energy rods with the fuel rods it's going to pick up radioactive waste so it's going to make this turbine contaminated we have three loops so this water never turns into steam it just gets super hot this super hot water is then what turns this water into steam the steam turns the turbine which causes the electricity this water needs to be cooled down and turned back into liquid so that's where we get the water from the river or the lake to cool it down because that water gets too warm it needs to be cooled before it goes back in the river or lake and that is what the cooling tower is for our way is more efficient it works better it's more expensive which is why the Soviets didn't do it three mile island also had a pump failure they had a meltdown but they were able to contain everything it was called a successful failure a failure in that there was a meltdown 
a success in that very little radioactive steam got out. How is the steam condensed? Oh, hold on. Any questions? Any questions? Does Three Mile Island not have a backup? Yes. They had backup redundancy systems. I mean, it, the worst thing that could have happened happened, but everything they had in place to prevent it from becoming an accident, like Chernobyl, worked beautifully. It was still operator error. Okay, the two of the three accidents were operator errors. The third one was an earthquake, a big giant earthquake, and Fukushima went through the earthquake all right. What they could not deal with was the big giant tidal wave. We'll talk about that. How is the steam condensed again? Water from a river or lake. What's the problem with this? What is the problem with this? Well, it's going to heat up the lake water, so we use a cooling tower. Let them explain to you how a cooling tower works. Cooling towers are commonly part of thermal power stations and are the most recognizable feature of a nuclear power plant. Cooling towers are shell structures built of concrete in which hot water is allowed to cool. Thereby, thermal energy is released to the environment. The most well-known form is the natural draft wet cooling tower, as shown in this animation. Natural draft wet cooling towers can be up to 200 meters tall and are made up of a cold water basin, an air inlet near the bottom of the tower, spray nozzles, and drift eliminator. Other elements, such as tower patterns, are also commonly used in order to increase efficiency. For clarity, however, these are not described here. Hot water is pumped to the spray nozzles. Natural convection draws cold air in from outside. The cold air cools the water. During this process, about 2% of the water evaporates. This can be seen as plumes of steam. Natural draft wet cooling towers function according to the simple principle of the stack effect, also known as natural sip. The shape of it is what causes it to work. Okay, I've been in one of these things. They're huge. And the crazy thing, it literally is on stilts. They told us when we toured Watts Bar to make sure that the young ladies did not wear skirts. Okay, we got to actually go into that lower portion. Do you know why the girls were not allowed to wear skirts? Oh, yeah, the updraft. I mean, it was windy. You've never, ex I mean, it's weird because you experience wind from different sides. It, it's, it's weird when you experience wind coming up. As it was, guys were going, ooh, ooh. And, and uh, it's just, if you had had a skirt, it was really a neat experience. Since warm air is less than some cold air, warm air rises due to buoyancy and escapes out of the upper opening of the tower. This leads to self-preservation of the stack effect. In nuclear power plants, cooling towers are responsible for the cooling of cooling water, which is used to cool down the secondary circulation system. The advantages of natural draft wet cooling towers are low energy consumption, low maintenance requirements, and the low service life. All right. There is the water that needs to be stored along with the fuel, the spent fuel. And that spent fuel is going to be hot for a long time. So this is really not a good place to go swimming. All right? There's robotic arms that go and mess with this water. The, this is where eventually the spent fuel is stored in big giant crates. Or um, not crates. Barrels. Barrels. There are a bunch of these sites 
about five miles away in Y12. Okay, there's a bunch of these hills and where a lot of this spent fuel is stored. All right, three famous meltdowns, TMI in 77, Chernobyl in 88, and of course Fukushima in 2010. They were, two of them were caused by human error. One was caused by a big giant earthquake. Let me show you how Fukushima worked. What happened? Friday, March the 11th, at 2.46 p.m., an exceptionally powerful earthquake hit the Pacific coast of Honshu, the main island of Japan. At 3.36 p.m., less than an hour after the earthquake, a tsunami swept over the coast. The waves went all the way up to 10 kilometers inland. Result, over 20,000 people dead or missing, destroyed towns, ports and land devastated. Nuclear power plants were also affected, one in particular, namely the Fukushima Daiichi. Fukushima Daiichi is 250 kilometers northeast of Tokyo. The nuclear power plant has six reactors, each reactor successively commissioned during the 1970s. Units 1, 2, and 3 were operating at full power. The core in Unit 4 was unloaded. Units 5 and 6 were in cold shutdown. Fukushima reactors have a different technology than the pressurized water reactors built by the French operator EDF. They are boiling water reactors called BWRs. We say reactor because the heat in the core is produced by fission reactions. Boiling water, because the water that removes the heat from the core turns into steam, and the steam goes directly to the turbine. The turbine drives the generator that produces electricity. Afterwards, the steam is condensed with the help of a seawater cooling system and returns to the core. A boiling water reactor has only one single system combining feed water and steam. The core is composed of fuel assemblies containing uranium. It is controlled by control rods introduced from the bottom that can stop the fission reactions in case of an emergency. Fission of uranium nuclei produces radioactive atoms that in turn produce heat, and this continues to occur even after reactor shutdown. This is called residual heat. Keeping the fuel confined and cooled is a major safety issue. The fuel is isolated from the environment by different containment barriers, just like the famous Russian dolls. A first barrier, the fuel cladding of zirconium alloy. A second barrier, the steel reactor vessel in combination with steam and water cooling systems. Finally, the third barrier, the containment building in concrete with a leak tight steel liner. The fuel is kept under water in the reactor as well as in the adjacent pool where the spent fuel is unloaded. The pool is located at the top of the reactor vessel to facilitate the transfer of fuel under water. When the earthquake hit the coast, seismic sensors triggered the insertion of control rods. Although fission reactions stopped, the residual heat had to be removed. The off-site power supply was lost, and the emergency diesel generators took over automatically. They supply electricity to the backup systems needed for core cooling. In reactors two and three, it is a turbo pump. Okay, keep in mind that this is the ground level here, okay? Most of this is underground. Everything's all right here. The earthquake has occurred. A big, massive earthquake. They've lost power, but these diesel generators are working, pumping the water. Everything is okay now. All right? The steam generated by the reactor operates the turbo pump, which feeds water into the reactor vessel. The steam is condensed, 
in the wet well suppression pool within the containment. In reactor one, there was no turbo pump, but a heat exchanger, which condensed steam from the reactor vessel. The condensed water was reintroduced into the reactor vessel by gravity. This heat exchanger provided core cooling by natural convection for more than 10 hours. Until then, everything seemed under control. However, reactor one, due to excessive cooling, forced the operators to temporarily isolate the heat exchanger in compliance with operating procedures. The tsunami wave arrived less than an hour after the earthquake. The waves went over the seawall, flooding the lower parts of buildings and disabled the emergency diesel generators. On reactor one, the operator was unable to reactivate the heat exchanger. The core was no longer cooled. It would be the first to melt. So everything was working okay, and it was working perfectly, but they shut down this exchanger here in order, because that was just normal. Shut it down, put it back on, shut it down, put it back on. So when the tidal wave came through, it wouldn't come back on. So now you have nothing cooling down this super hot reactor. On units two and three, the batteries were still operational. They operated some of the valves. The turbine driven pumps ran for nearly 24 hours and then stopped. The cores were no longer cooled. The water got in and stopped the, the diesel pumps. The meltdown scenario is almost the same in all three reactors, only the dates change. The water in the reactor vessel evaporated. The fuel became uncovered. Heated up to a temperature of 2,300 degrees Celsius, the fuel melted and mixed with the materials from the structure to form a magma called corium. The corium flowed down to the bottom of the reactor vessel. According to Japanese officials, it pierced the reactor vessel before falling on the concrete base mat inside the containment. What quantity of corium fell? How deep did it erode the concrete? Did it pierce the steel liner? Even today, it is not possible to learn more about the state of the corium in the three reactors. At the same time, still in the reactor vessel, the steam was loaded with radioactive elements and hydrogen. To explain this phenomenon, let's have a look at the early stages of fuel degradation. Heated at high temperature, the fuel cladding is oxidized and cracks, releasing volatile radioactive elements. In addition to this, the zirconium of the fuel clad created a reaction with the steam by absorbing the oxygen and by releasing hydrogen. Normally, when mixed with air, hydrogen catches fire and explodes. However, the containment building was filled with nitrogen, an inert gas that avoids the presence of oxygen. At this stage, there was no risk. As the steam pressure rose to a dangerous level in the reactor vessel, the depressurizing valves opened. Gas was forced into the wet well suppression pool by a venting line. The water acted as an efficient filter by trapping much of the radioactive elements. But the water was no longer cooled because the emergency diesel generators were out of order, and it soon began to boil thereby reducing its filtration capacity. The wet well suppression pool in the communicating containment began to enter into an overpressure situation. To avoid containment rupture, the operator decided to release the gas into the atmosphere. Normally, the venting line should have led all the gas outside the building by the chimney of the plant but hydrogen was escaping through uncontrolled leakage pathways and was released into the reactor building. Hydrogen reacts violently with oxygen in the air. The explosion blew apart the frame at the top of the building, apparently without damaging the containment building. Radioactive elements not yet trapped in the wet well suppression pool were released into the environment. Due to the absence of usable fresh water on the site, the operators decided to inject seawater 
into the reactor vessel. This solution, far from ideal, since salt is chemically active, had at least the advantage of cooling and stabilizing the corium. In the four days following the tsunami, the four reactors were damaged by explosions, and three of them with core melt. Although it has kept its structure intact, Reactor 2 is the current source of the most important radioactive releases into the soil as well as into the sea. The explosion took place inside the building. Operators have probably encountered difficulties depressurizing the containment and the wet well suppression pool broke. This loss of leak tightness led to the discharge into the atmosphere of unfiltered radioactive elements and to the spreading of highly contaminated water in the buildings leading to highly polluting discharges into the sea. The explosion of reactor 4 was due to hydrogen even though the core was completely unloaded. The hydrogen came from reactor 3 via a joint pipe. The reactor storage pools were also a great concern because they had lost their cooling systems and in addition to this, they were not protected by any containment. Very little spent fuel was stored in pool 1. However, there was much more in pools 2, 3, and 4, especially pool 4, which contained the equivalent of the three cores. In all three pools, the water started to boil, and without the help in extremis of cold water from helicopters and from a fire hose, the spent fuel would have caused considerable radioactive release into the environment. Gradually, Look at the that, situation please. began to stabilize. By the end of March 2011, fresh water had replaced seawater. In July, the, the reactor cooling system was again in operation in closed circuit, thereby avoiding discharges of contaminated water into the environment. Look at that. In December 2011, Japanese authorities officially declared that the nuclear power plant reached the cold shutdown state, an expression used when the cooling water does not evaporate anymore and remains liquid below 100 degrees Celsius. There's some question as to there's some question as to how much radioactive material has gone into the sea. It's a lot. How will it affect it? It's a great big ocean. I've got a good friend who works here at uh, the SNS, and he seems to believe that it's all going to be diluted out. Then you have some environmentalists who are saying that they're already picking up higher levels of radioactive emissions coming from the Pacific Ocean in, on, in San Francisco and San Diego and L.A. So, I don't know. Terrible. I think we need to be very careful building these reactors so close to the ocean, especially where there's possibility that there could be an earthquake. All right, so tomorrow we will do fusion energy and end this. All right, so let's focus on nuclear fusion. The opposite, where nuclear fission, you have a large atom being split into smaller ones. In nuclear fusion, you have a two smaller ones being fused together to form a larger one. So what is another way of producing nuclear energy? Forcing tiny atoms to smash together to form large atoms. Fusion. Where does this naturally take place? It takes place in the sun. Fusion energy in the sun is how we get the heat and light that fuels our planet. Fusion reactions, as you'd expect, are very different from fission. For one thing, the energy released in many fusion reactions dwarfs even the huge amount released by fission. You might be familiar, for example, with the wonderful work done by our sun. The reactions that power the sun are like most fusion reactions in that they involve very small nuclei, like isotopes of hydrogen and helium. This reaction begins when two atoms of hydrogen, accelerated by the sun's fantastically high temperatures and contained by its high pressures, join to form an atom of deuterium, an isotope of hydrogen. This 
fusion of particles releases a positron and some heat energy in the process. Then another atom of hydrogen is joined to deuterium to form helium-3. This step also releases a lot of energy in the form of gamma radiation. When two atoms of helium-3 are available, they join together to form an atom of helium-4, as well as two atoms of regular hydrogen, which then can be used to begin the process all over again. This final step also, as you might imagine, releases a large amount of energy in the form of mostly gamma radiation. So this is a chain reaction too, but it's not a self-perpetuating one like we saw before. This reaction requires a total input of six atoms of hydrogen, but it only produces two in the end, the remaining mass being released in the form of helium. For this reason, more fuel is always needed, which is why our sun is gonna run out of hydrogen in about five and a half billion years. We can produce fusion reactions here on Earth too, but they're not very useful for us because we haven't figured out how to control them. They're super useful if you just want to blow up a big city, though, just to be clear depending on your definition of use. One reason is, as you can see in the mass energy graph, light nuclei that fuse together undergo a much larger energy change than heavy nuclei that break apart. That means their reactions release far more energy than fission reactions do, so much more that it's nearly impossible to contain and therefore use. Also, because fusion involves joining nuclei, the reaction has to overcome the really strong repulsion that naturally exists between their positive charges. For this reason, fusion reactions can only occur when particles collide at very high speeds or under very high pressures. At these mind-blowing speeds, the kinetic energy of the particles produces insane temperatures like in the 100 million Kelvin range, at which point the material being accelerated actually exists in the form of plasma. So not only are those speeds really hard to reach, but material at that temperature how do you control that? Which is why we can't use fusion for things like generating electricity, which would be super nice. We've only found applications for it when we don't need to control it at all, like in nuclear weapons. So as you can tell, there is plenty of room for new ideas in nuclear chemistry. Fusion would be really great because it would produce a lot of energy and you'd just get helium out of the process, and helium is awesome. How okay. So, give an equation to describe this nuclear fusion four hydrogen atoms coming together to form helium-42 and two positrons. Guys, we've got a ton of hydrogen atoms, all right? One of the most plentiful compounds on the Earth is water, and water has hydrogen. So the really cool thing about nuclear fusion is that the fuel is endless and it's relatively easy to make unlike enriching uranium how much energy does a nuclear fusion reaction produce one mole one tiny little gram because a mole of hydrogen is just one gram can produce 6.2 times 10 to the eighth kilojoules that is a lot That's a lot of zeros past the two. The problem is we really do not have the technology to contain that much energy. So therein is one of the disadvantages. How does energy output compare with gasoline burning? One gram of hydrogen is roughly equivalent to 5,000 gallons of gasoline. One gram, 5,000 gallons of gasoline. Do you see why it's so attractive? The problem with fusion energy is quite simple, my friends. Let me simplify it so that you can understand. Okay? If it cost us a hundred dollars, to make a fusion generator work, that fusion generator right now will give us $65 worth of electricity. Let me repeat that. If we spend $100 to make a fusion generator work, that fusion generator can only make for us $65 worth of electricity. Why aren't electric companies rushing out to build fusion generators. <clears throat> well, they're going to lose money. You're going to lose money. We are looking desperately.
to the day that we can break even. It's called the break even point. The break even point on that day, you will put in $100 worth of electricity in order to make this work. And what will you get out? $100, which is still not going to cause electric companies to rush out and build nuclear reactors, fusion reactors. Okay, but at least at that point, we are at the break even, right? So what if technology improves and we're able to figure more stuff out? Then maybe, just maybe, 50 years down the line, we will be at $100 in, $120 out. At that point, hmm, some people might start building nuclear fusion reactors, okay? The whole, this whole mess, whether it's equals, whether it's fission or fusion, is based on the equation E equals mc squared. If E equals mc squared doesn't work, which I have only in Oak Ridge do you have next door neighbors that spend 20 years of their lives trying to prove E equals mc squared doesn't work. But I have my next door neighbor, he's 72 years old. He has spent the last 20 years, he has these copious uh, notes where he is trying to prove that E equals MC squared doesn't work. <sighs> if he succeeds, will it change anything? Mm, not really, we can still make this nuclear fission and fusion work, okay? Our ability to predict why it works and how it works is going to be seriously damaged but it still works we just can't explain why so what are the problems and advantages associated with our quest for harnessing fusion energy what are advantages give me one give me one okay it's very efficient uh, give me another one. What? Yeah, what is produced is the kind of stuff that you can put in your birthday balloons. Yay! So all that nuclear waste we can make birthday balloons out of. Wow. Uh, some of the stuff that's produced is radioactive, but a lot of helium-4 is, is, is produced, and that's not radioactive. What else? What are some other advantages? Are we ever going to run out of fuel? The day that we run out of water, in which case, if we were running out of water, we got more serious problems than nuclear fusion. Yeah. Okay. So we have an endless amount. Well, let's do the problems first. What are some problems with fusion? Okay. Potential for not being able to harness the energy, which could cause a major accident. What else? What's the biggest problem with we can't fusion? We can't do it. We can't do it. We spend more energy trying to make it work than energy that we can get out of it. We do not have the technology to keep to, to do it safely. How do you get all that energy? Transfer it. Water may not be may not work here. We're gonna have to convert it. In some way because it's just thermal we have to convert it to electrical energy in some way
What are the problems? What are the advantages? Fuel that would be used would be endless. The amount of energy would be endless. The waste produced would be less radioactive. And we are now done with the portion of this chapter that covers what's on the test.